Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth. Today's saint is someone who you might recognize because he is celebrated all over the world. Even though many people, when they're celebrating him, they're not exactly sure what they're celebrating. He's the patron saint of Ireland, and if you are a fan of the color green, this just might be the saint for you. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about St. Patrick. Now, the famous celebration of St. Patrick's Day, or St. Patty's Day, is characterized by beer, by green clothes, by shamrocks, even by some extravagant partying, like the city of Chicago, which dyes their entire river green every single year in honor of this saint. But you might be wondering, what does this have to do with St. Patrick? Does it have anything to do with him at all? A lot of people don't think of St. Patrick as a real person, but he was. He was a real person who had truly amazing stories. He was a miracle worker. He was a model of bravery and holiness. And today we're going to learn his story so that we can be inspired to be saints like he was. And at the very least, the next time we're lifting up a pint of green beer on St. Patty's Day, we'll know a little bit more about who we're celebrating. Patrick was born in modern day Scotland in the year 387 AD. This was a Roman territory at the time. His family was high ranking because his father was a military officer in the Roman cavalry. Now, Patrick was raised in a Christian family, but Growing up, he wasn't really into his faith, especially in his teenage years. He didn't like to listen to the priests, and he wasn't really into his faith. But Patrick's life was going to change forever, because when he was only 16, he was kidnapped. He was kidnapped during a raid by Irish marauders, like pirates. And what the Irish would do is they would sometimes leave their home, and they would pillage the area that Patrick and his family lived in, and they would capture slaves and livestock and all these other treasures, and then they would return to their local lords back in Ireland with all these spoils. And so during one of these raids, Patrick was captured, and he was made a slave of a local Irish chieftain. And he worked as a slave for six years. He was especially working as a shepherd. He would tend the flocks of his master and he lived there in Ireland as a slave for six years. Now, a little background about Ireland at this time, it was populated by a Celtic people. And these Celtic people were warlike, obviously they were making raids. They had many different tribes with local lords, local chieftains. Uh, sometimes several local lords would get together and have one king over them and over their territory, but they were largely divided, many different people and many different customs, but they were not Christian. The Irish people at this time were pagans. They worshiped many different gods, gods of weather, gods of war, gods of all these different things. And in order to worship these gods, the Irish religion was led by a group of people called Druids. Now, the Druids were men and women who were renowned amongst the people and feared by them as powerful magicians. So the Druids could uh, reportedly tell the future. They could heal people who were sick. Uh, if they didn't like you or you had angered them, they could curse you with death or sickness. And the Druids got their magical powers from the demons who they worshipped. The false gods of the people were demons who had enslaved the people, and they were the ones who were giving these druids their magical powers to impress and keep the people bound in fear. The druids were also responsible for the human sacrifice that was required by the Celtic pagan gods. So the druids would drown people in bogs as sacrifices to the gods. They would burn them alive as an offering to the gods, and they would do this with adults and children. So it was a very wicked, a very dark, a very evil religion that Ireland was steeped in at this time. 
Ironically, it's amongst all these pagans and their gods that Patrick begins to have an authentic conversion. He's spending a lot of time alone among the sheep, and while he's out there working as a slave, he feels drawn to the God of his childhood, and he begins to spend long times in prayer. Patrick later describes what this time was like in his writings. He says, it was among foreigners that it was seen how little I was. It was there that the Lord opened up my awareness of my lack of faith. Even though it came about late, I recognized my failings. And so I turned with all my heart to the Lord, my God, and he looked down on my lowliness and had mercy on my youthful ignorance. So Patrick is growing closer to God. He's praying a lot. And one day, Patrick has a dream in which a divine voice tells him, very soon, you will return to your native country. And shortly after this experience, the same voice tells him, look, your ship is ready. And Patrick is given this prophetic, supernatural knowledge of a ship that's about 200 miles away in a place he's never seen. And yet he trusts the voice, he runs away, he runs away from his master, and he finds the ship exactly where it was told it would be. Now, when he went up to the crew, he asked to come on board, but the pagan captain initially didn't want to take him. So Patrick is leaving disappointed, dejected, and he asks God for help. And even before he's finished praying, the crew changed their mind and allowed him to come on board. And so Patrick sails back to his homeland, back to his family. They're overjoyed to see him. They promise, they ask him to never leave them again, to promise never to leave. But Patrick is a changed man at this point. He's not the same man who was taken into slavery. He is totally devoted to God and he's feeling the call to become a priest. So he pursues holiness. He continues praying. Eventually he is ordained a priest. And later on, he's consecrated to be a bishop. And so Bishop Patrick uh, actually becomes involved in ministry in his homeland. He works to fight against uh, a heresy called Pelagianism. And this Pelagian heresy was becoming very popular. And it was basically a twisting of the true Christian faith because Pelagians were teaching that we didn't actually need God's grace to be saved, but we as human beings, we could earn it ourselves through our hard work, based on our own efforts, on our own human nature, we could reach heaven by ourselves. But Patrick and his friends were working to fight against this twisted doctrine, saying, no, we need God's grace to be saved. Going to heaven is a gift from God. It can only be given to us through Jesus. We can't earn it ourselves. He was very successful in defending the truth of the faith. But despite Patrick's successful ministry at home, he begins to feel this call to go back to Ireland to evangelize the pagans who had made him their slave. And he begins to have dreams at night of Irish people coming to him and begging him to return to them, begging him to walk amongst them once again. And so Patrick goes to the Pope, Pope St. Celestine I, and he asks permission to lead a missionary group to Ireland to evangelize them. Now, the Pope had already sent someone to evangelize the Irish, but he had returned. He had fled the country due to savage opposition from some of the Irish chieftains. So Ireland was seen as a dangerous mission field, and yet Patrick wants to go, and so the Pope gives him permission. And so he gathers a missionary group to make the trip to begin the evangelization of, of Ireland. And we can see the hand of God in this because Patrick had learned the Celtic language used by the Irish during his time in slavery. And so God was preparing him even as a slave to one day return with the life-saving gospel of Jesus for the Irish. Patrick landed in Ireland and his first goal was to go back to the territory where he had been enslaved in order to pay a ransom to his former master, almost to apologize for running away. And this, we see Patrick's humility, his radical forgiveness 
to go back to his master and evangelize him. And on the way, he's sharing the gospel, and many of the local Irish people are responding with joy. They're converting. They're becoming Christians. And these conversions continued, especially after Patrick performed his first miracle. You see, the Druids saw that he was having an effect, that their spiritual grip on the people through their demonic gods was being broken by Patrick. And so they were enraged at him and they stirred up an Irish chieftain to go and kill him. And this Irish chieftain went to go and kill Patrick, but as he raised his sword to kill him, his arm froze and he couldn't do it. His arm was frozen in place. And so Patrick released him from this freezing effect and the chieftain immediately became a Christian. And he actually donated one of his huge barns to become their first church to say mass in. So that didn't work. The Druids are frustrated and Patrick arrived in his former slave territory to find that his master, his former master, who was himself a Druid, had actually burned down his own house and thrown himself into the fire rather than face defeat at the hands of Patrick because stories of his miracles and of his holiness had preceded him. And so in his pride, he didn't want to be converted. He didn't want to be forgiven by Patrick. And so he flung himself into his own fire and committed suicide in order to avoid him. Patrick, at this point, learns from the local Irish chieftains who had converted that all of the Irish lords and minor kings had been summoned for a great festival by their overlord, who was named King Leary. King Leary was kind of like the king of all the lords of that area. And King Leary had called this great festival to be had at the Hill of Tara. The Hill of Tara was this Irish ceremonial site. It was a, a sacred burial ground and was also the seat where kings would be enthroned. So it was a very important location. And King Leary was having a great fire festival. So there would be a big bonfire. There would be dancing, pagan ceremony, feasting. And then all the other fires in the surrounding area would be put out. So the whole place would be in darkness. And then messengers would bring fire from the major bonfire to all the other homes in the area so that they would all receive the fire from the one ceremony officiated over by King Leary and the Druids. Well, Patrick heard about this and he saw this as an opportunity for a showdown between the God of the Christians and all the pagan gods of the Druids who were gathered for the festival. And so no other fire was allowed to be lit except for the King's fire. But right across the hill from the King's fire on his own hill, Patrick started his own fire. It was the Paschal fire of Easter. If you've ever been to an Easter vigil, you know that a bonfire is lit. So Patrick starts his own fire and the Druids see the fire burning across from them. And they go to the king and they say, this fire, which has been lit in defiance of your royal edict, it will blaze forever in this land unless you extinguish it this night. And so the king sends out soldiers and his Druids to put out the fire of Patrick, but they're unable to do it. God supernaturally protected Patrick, all the other Christians, and the fire from being put out. So again, it's this other victory of Jesus over the pagan gods of Ireland, signifying that their time is up. And the very next day, Patrick travels to the hill of Tara and engages in a showdown with the Druids in front of all the assembled chieftains of Ireland. It's a spiritual battle for the souls of the Irish people. And so the Druids begin to work all of their magical arts. They call down this huge darkness that covered the land. It obscured the sun to show off their power. And Patrick then dares them. He says, well, you brought down this darkness, but can you lift it? And they were unable to do so. And then Patrick knelt in prayer and the sun broke through the darkness and shone with light on the crowd. So he's showing that his God is more powerful. One of the arch druids actually, using his magical demonic abilities, actually suspended himself into the air. He began to fly. But Patrick prayed and the druid came crashing down to the ground. 
Well, this show of God's supernatural power over the false gods of the Druids convinced all of the chieftains who were watching that the Christian God was the true God. And King Leary gave permission to Patrick and his missionaries to begin evangelizing in his region. And so the word of Jesus began to spread throughout Ireland. Now, even though Patrick had received the permission of the king and the local chieftains, he still faced opposition. It wasn't over yet throughout his whole mission, but he was undeterred. And the gospel continued to spread across Ireland like wildfire, despite the persecution that he faced. In fact, he was often in danger. Patrick once was traveling somewhere in his chariot, and his chariot driver was killed during an assassination attempt on his life. The assassin thought that his chariot driver was Patrick himself, so he was always under threat. He was kidnapped and arrested 12 different times by local chiefs. At one point, he was even sentenced to death, but the sentence was never carried out. He escaped and he continued on undaunted. Patrick traveled all over Ireland, establishing churches, building convents and monasteries, baptizing thousands and thousands of Irish converts to Christianity. And Patrick became famous for working of miracles, for performing many healings, for even raising the dead. And of course, his preaching combined with these miracles showing the power of God convinced many people of the truth of Christianity and they forsake their idols. They took down their pagan statues. They stopped the human sacrifice. They stopped listening to the Druids. In fact, many of the Druids converted as well. And Patrick continued to spread the gospel of Jesus throughout Ireland. He consecrated hundreds of bishops to keep the church going after he passed on. He ordained many priests, many convents filled with nuns were started and monasteries with Irish monks. And Christianity began to take root in Ireland. In addition to Patrick's many miracles to spread the faith, he would also use very simple tools to evangelize the people. Remember, he's dealing with people that have never heard of Jesus before, never heard the gospel, never heard about the fact that God loves them, that he sent his son to die for them. And so he would announce his presence when he would come into a village with a bell. He would ring a bell, people would come out and see what's going on, and then he would start to tell them about Jesus. He would also uh, use a shamrock you know, this plant with three leaves in one to symbolize the Trinity, to teach the basic understanding of the Trinity, that we worship one God. And yet this one God is in a Trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he was uh, using these simple tools to reach people with the faith. As well, his evangelical success, the amount of people that were converting the fruit that he was bearing in Ireland was based on his intense prayer, fasting, and penance. Patrick would wear uh, hair shirts, very itchy and uncomfortable, in order to offer up penance for the souls of the people that he was trying to reach. He would fast, he would go without food for a long period of time, he would sleep on the ground, he would sleep on the rocks in order to offer up all of these sacrifices for his people. And whenever grateful converts who were so happy to receive the gospel would try to give him gifts, he would always give them back because he didn't want to be paid for preaching the gospel. He wanted it to be a complete gift, just like Jesus's offering of his blood for us was a free gift. And Patrick sometimes would take a break from ministry, take a break from preaching, and he would go into the mountains to fast and pray for the Irish people. He would go there for long periods of retreat to intercede for them. And sometimes during these uh, trips, demons would come and assault him because remember, he was invading their territory. They were worshiped by the people. They received all these human sacrifices and they were not happy that Patrick had come in with the gospel of Jesus and broken their hold of fear and death on the people of Ireland. And so they assaulted him, they tormented him, but he would continue to pray and break their power. And he pleaded with God for the souls of his people. And as we can see, it bore fruit. Thousands of people converted to Christianity and Ireland was reached with the gospel. 
Now, Patrick eventually died as an old man, and his funeral was attended by thousands of people who loved him for bringing Jesus to their land, who loved him because he had brought them the life-saving faith in Jesus that had made all the difference, that he had rescued them from the power of the Druids and the pagan gods that they used to worship. So you can probably see from hearing all of this why St. Patrick is such a big deal in Ireland. If you are of Irish descent and you're listening in, you probably have had your faith in some way affected by this man who lived so long ago. But for all of us, no matter our background, our ethnicity, I think we can see why Patrick is such a great saint who we can be inspired by. He was a man who lived a life of prayer and penance. He was humble. He had a zeal, a burning zeal for souls. He wanted to reach the world with the truth about Jesus, to break them out of their superstition and their lies and their idolatry. And Patrick is a model of forgiveness. He was able to forgive the people who enslaved him, who tore him away from his family. And he risked everything to bring them Jesus. So truly, St. Patrick is a man who deserves to be celebrated. And so the next time you raise a pint of green beer on St. Patty's Day, why don't you think of the great saint who evangelized Ireland and commit yourself to becoming a saint like he was? Well, we've reached the end of our time now, but why don't we close by praying for the intercession of St. Patrick so that we can follow his example in order to become saints ourselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Patrick, we ask for your great love of the Trinity, that even as we say those words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we would worship the Trinity as you worship the Trinity. And give us an understanding of the three persons in one God that you were able to teach the people of Ireland. St. Patrick, we ask for your intercession that we would, like you, have a constant prayer life, that we would always be close to the Lord, that we would give our permission to God to go wherever we are called, just like you were, called back to Ireland, called out of your homeland. Give us an evangelical zeal for souls like you had. Allow us to love people and have a deep desire to reach out to them with the life-changing message of what Jesus has done for us. And St. Patrick, we ask for your boldness, for a willingness to step out in faith and see the supernatural, that just like you performed miracles of healing and raising the dead and showing the power of God over nature, that we too would be able to step out in faith and see signs and wonders that proclaim the authenticity of the gospel that we believe. St. Patrick, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.